Welcome to the General Conference Administration Seminar. You know, there's two modes or two states of the Christian experience, and the first one is survival mode. The survival mode is perhaps one of the most common ones. It's very comfortable. Um, nothing much is going on in this mode or this state, and anything that goes on is simply calculated at risk. And if you take any risk whatsoever, it is done purely to survive the Christian experience. When we go to thriving mode, lots of things are happening. Promises are being kept. God is uh, acting through your life. You're having an amazing relationship with Him. But there's a big problem when we go to survival mode. And the biggest problem with survival mode is that you have bad habits. And these bad habits are a result of your experience. And they're only bad because they're based on what you can accomplish through your own strength. When we go to survival mode, all of these principles and acquired experience are based on what God can accomplish through your life. And that is the biggest difference. So that is why we want to go from survival all the way to thriving. And in order to take those leaps of faith, we need to have faith. And that is why the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that is why throughout the seminar we're going to go back to the basics, back to the fundamentals Christian beliefs and see what God has to say in His Word. But before we do, we're going to go into our special music item and then we'll be right back. Let us now go into this evening's topic by Pastor Livio Tudoroyo as he explores the concept of cause and effect and why your future is malleable when you embrace Christian temperance. But before we do, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us and also for the opportunity that you give us to study your word. 
as we dive into the study of your scriptures, we ask you that you may give us of your Holy Spirit so he can guide us into all truth. We ask all these blessings, not because we're worthy, but in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the interest you have uh, on the topic of uh, our fundamental Christian beliefs. We study the principle of faith in the time of great health crisis, brothers and sisters. The challenges we face every day as a church and individual members makes us to review the values and the ideals of what we believe. A deeper investigation in the Word of God is vital for our salvation. The way we eat, drink, work, rest, think, or speak decides our survival. The only hope of better things is the education of the people in right principles. Brothers and sisters, God's providence is inviting us to a next level of examining our spirituality. The Latin poet Virgil, in his second book or volume entitled Georgics, written somewhere in 29 BC, if I'm not mistaken, pointed out the fact that knowledge and understanding of things are reason of being at peace with your conscience. Fortunate is he who was able to know the cause of all things, which means that we are very, very happy if we understand the fundamental relationship between cause and effect. Indeed, fortunate and blessed is the man who can understand the cause of all things. We agree that Christianity has received light from the Lord Jesus Christ regarding the one of many fundamental laws, cause slash effect, as guide of approaching such a subject. The way we eat, as I said, the way we work, drink, rest, speak, and think will cause significant effects that will be perceived in the quality of our life, the life that we live. An inquiry in the origins of this word, temperance, would eventually conflict with something that we will call too much. But in the context of our fundamental Christian beliefs, brothers and sisters, the connotation of temperance or Christian temperance may lead us to a total abstinence regarding harmful habits in diet and eventually in our lifestyle. There are Christians that are totally abstinent from alcohol while others use it uh, randomly, occasionally. There are Christians that believe that tobacco is very harmful and totally avoiding such a habit, while others use especially uh, in occasions where they can smoke a cigarette to impress the people around. There are Christians that are totally abstinent or abstaining from meat consumption, while others use it occasionally. There are people that have a total plant-based diet where any animal product is excluded, while other people use dairy products randomly, even though they have a meatless diet. There are people that use only organic products, while others use any kind of products can be found in the market. My dear friends, there are people that fulfill the ideal of our Christian faith by enjoying the country living, working the land, and eating fruits and vegetables that are the product of their own labor, drinking water from their own well, and obviously the list can continue, but obviously these are blessings for those that have such an exposure and opportunities. In many different parts of the world, they do not have the privileges that are recommended by the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. That is why we pray for the end of misery and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, we believe that salvation comes through the blood of Jesus Christ alone, our dear Savior. We do not believe that our salvation comes through carrot juice, for instance, or veganism, or impeccable dietary lifestyle. We do not believe that isolation from society or even the monasterial lifestyle will give us any merits to earn the eternal life. Then, if Christian temperance, if a lifestyle, if a special diet, if a special behavior does not offer us eternal life, why this subject, though? 
because we believe that salvation is conditional. The gift of God is, is conditional to those that believe and live according to the profession of their faith. Since salvation is conditional, temperance proves character. Christian temperance proves the existence of principles recommended by the Creator in our personal daily life. The followers of Jesus Christ will always have a choice ahead of them. Freedom is a gift of God, while choice will may come always with price called consequences. Christian temperance, it's a way out of slavery, my dear friends. It's way out of vice and addiction. Christian temperance is a way out to freedom. In fact, with your permission, I will share a few Bible verses that approaches Christian temperance from at least three perspectives. Number one, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So, my dear friends, my question is, if all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient, all things are lawful for me, but no, I will not be brought under the power of any. They are not beneficial to me, to my body, to my mind. So why should I waste my money, my energy, and at the end, my health for something that is not to be beneficial? Brothers and sisters, in the Word of God, there is no neutrality when it comes to obedience. The second point emphasized by Apostle Paul, it is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. In the Word of God, brothers and sisters, we find that there is no such thing as neutrality. When it comes to obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, we face few statements, at least few statements, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, who is not with me is against me. Who does not gather with me, he is wasting. So following the same train of thoughts, we can conclude that if something does not edify, weakens our mind or our body. The next principle involved in is the freedom of choice expressed in the first part of Apostle Paul's statement. All things are lawful for me. I had the privilege to talk to people in various occasions and being addressed a very, very sensitive question. Oftentimes, you share the gospel, the beauty of Christ's character, and people uh, ask you a question. Sir, does your religion give you permission or allow you to drink alcohol? Or other type of questions that I face many times. Sir, I understand that you have a vegetarian lifestyle. Is that because your religion does not give you permission to eat meat? How would you respond to such a very challenging question, my friend? I do answer according to Apostle Paul's statement. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. How can we translate that in a modern language? The way that I respond to people when they ask such a frequent questions, if my religion allows me to drink alcohol, if my religion allows me or give me permission to eat meat, if my religion allows me to smoke a cigarette, if my religion allows me to dance, if my religion allows me to wear jewelries, I, I respond in this way, sir, my religion is an intelligent religion. Why? Because it's based on an intelligent educational set of teachings. My religion it's an intelligent religion and is based on a form of education that it has the foundation in the Holy Word of God, the Scripture. If I don't drink alcohol, if I don't uh, smoke, if I don't use tobacco, it is because it's my choice. It is my choice to follow the biblical guidance and biblical recommendation serving the Lord Jesus Christ it is my choice, my friend. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, But as free men or women in Christ, I say, we cannot using your liberty for a cloth of maliciousness, but as the servant of God, 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. So in translation, in modern language, for the average uh, individual, we oftentimes can be found at fault of abusing the grace of God. When we do things that will not edify our mind and our body, but destroy it, we know that we are going against our conscience that oftentimes warns us then we know that we are doing things that will destroy, will deprive our mind, will deprive our body of the strength and the energy and the wisdom and capability to live a happy life. We know that we are in conflict with our Heavenly Father, doing things that are not supposed to be done. Then we are found at fault, abusing the grace of God. So this is what Apostle Peter says. I'm not gonna use my freedom to abuse the grace of God under the cloth of freedom to go against what I know that is not right. I am free to choose, but I will not be brought under the power of any, Apostle Paul said. God knows how easy we can lose our freedom. Freedom is a choice only for the free. Please mark this statement. Freedom is a choice only for the free. Uh, by the way, I have a text. Uh, Fedor uh, Mikhailovich uh, Dostoevsky was defining such a great deception by saying the following. The best way to hinder a prisoner to escape is to make sure that he does not know that he is captive. Nothing can be more deceiving than to believe this lie that I am bragging about my freedom while being subject or slave to vice and addiction. I have few statements that defines temperance in the Holy Scripture, and one of them is presented in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 27, by the great king that was defeated by sin, and his name is well known, Solomon. And he says, it is not good to eat much honey. It is not good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor any Thing whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. That's another statement that refers to temperance uh, specified in Romans chapter 14, verse 21 by Apostle Paul. It is not good to drink wine or to eat flesh, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. My son, if you start to write books, there is no ending. So, Either we eat too much honey, either we drink wine or eat meat, or we study and study and study. All this will affect our health, the health of our mind, the health of our body, and the happiness, which is a state of our mind. Our civilization has increased the appetite for technological achievements, research, engineers, and those with similarity computerized jobs have made science the new compass of our society. All segments of society are affected in one way or another. As a result, the world is migrating, is shifting more and more away from old-fashioned country living style to the conglomerated habitations of the cities. In consequence, many people flock to work in computers, in office work, seeing their comfort zone, seeking their achievements, and achieving the dream of prosperity. How few are those who are still in love with nature and prefer humble lifestyle, working the fields, enjoying gardening, for instance, watching how the plants grow, and finally, having the peace that comes from God. Country living is becoming more and more like a myth as new technologies demand greed personally inviting slash inciting people to abandon nature and merge with the dynamics of our cities. Progress is the immediate result. Look at the Silicon Valley. Of course, but in the long run, misery is creeping in. In the last year or so, brothers and sisters, hundreds of thousands of people have left the cities, and huge numbers have moved out of San Francisco, for example. New York, once the pride of the American nation, is expressing the same exodus or migration, if you wish. 
Those who feel the signs of times, those who have a sense of awareness that something unique and unusual is coming upon the world, those are in contact with the Word of God, are actually starting to run to save their lives. We may ask ourselves, how did our society reach such a stage of restlessness? Misery, pain, and death are the result of human departure from the original establishments planned by creation. The quality of life is diminishing every day, my friends. So-called green laws and green technology weaken the barely surviving world. Construction materials have skyrocketed in cost, the price of gas the same, and food is becoming an issue. Empty shelves in the grocery stores testify of the storm that is approaching. Officially, the leaders are prophesying that in this winter we'll see a lot of death. So where can the people go and how can we run to save our lives, to spare our lives? Advanced technology can spot you wherever you are in no time. So for oppressed people to find a peaceable hideout is almost impossible. For a better understanding, let us go in chapter 6 of this special book, the book of Job, that is set in the scripture, and read from 11 to 13. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh of brass? Is not my help in me, and is wisdom driven quiet from me? Those words, brothers and sisters, uttered by Job are a reflection of today's world. For instance, in France, I, I watched the video clip, very interesting references. They suggest that over 1 million people have died of coronavirus. 1.7 million have died of immune deficiency syndrome. 6 million of HIV. Tobacco kills over 6 million people every year as well. One question that might be addressed is why the world has not shut down the tobacco industry knowing that officially that plant called tobacco kills over 6 million people per year. Why did we not react to these facts by shutting down all the tobacco stores and in fact the entire tobacco industry? Meanwhile, we shut down the entire world under the guise of saving a number much smaller, alcohol, another plague of society has caused over 3 million people to die, and yet this industry was never shut down. Why does the world somehow fail to maintain consistency under the same premise of saving lives? We cannot go continue without recognizing also the 7 million people that have died of cancer and 3.4 million of faulty diet, a diet that has no quality for those that are consumers. Such apparent inconsistencies, brothers and sisters, are very hard to reconcile in the mind of, of the individuals that are doing proper math and can see through the issues. For most of us, it's not easy to digest or comprehend the contradictory explanations that are given to the herd. The world ends up in misery because we have a lot of questions without answers. And for that reason, we have a lot of problems without solutions. On the other extreme, there are people that work nonstop like robots and have lost appetite for life. They lost the joy of life and the taste of the beauty of life. That type of behavior is called workaholism. We do have to combine the mental work with the physical one, because we balance the strength of the system. People that do not do physical exercise will not have sufficient privileges to increase dopamine, the hormone of happiness in their body and in their brain, to balance their mind for a positive thinking, for instance. The world is shifting from worldliness to religious bigotry. Temperance is not only diet. Temperance is the way we focus on projects, the way we set our priorities. Temperance is needed when we train our mind to think uh, and what to think. 
Temperance is needed when we gossip, backbite about other people. Temperance is needed when we define reality of life. Temperance should be manifested when we dwell upon negative and toxic uh, thoughts, events, and circumstances. Temperance should invite us to properly combine hope with reality, if you wish. Temperance should be manifested when defining fate and presumption, and the list can continue. Physical work, especially the work in nature, benefiting the fresh air, will always vent the brain and help it to think positively. Positive thinking is generated by an active lifestyle and the proper dwelling on the promises of God that will impact the quality of our lives and the way we relate to the people around us. Only then we can be part of the general solution and not part of the general problem of humanity. An active lifestyle combined with the right thinking will make us to have a temperate and balanced lifestyle. That is Christian temperance. Vegetarianism and gossiping and backbiting will not help prove Christian temperance. If there was a time in the history of the world where the subject of temperance should be considered as an emergency, that time is today. The global crisis showed us once again that the health message mentioned in the writings of Ellen G. White are proven to be true. Let physician teach that the restorating power is not in drugs, but in nature. How many of our church members do still believe in this message of health reform, Christian temperance in the present time, my friends? How many still believe that? Sincerely, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from the conditions that are the result of the violation of the law of health. This is one of the majestic statements of Ellen G. White. The great misery in the world would not exist did men but live in harmony with the Creator's plan. That's a statement from the Zara of Ages, page 824. Christians that are temperate are happy people, brothers and sisters. Outside of this social segment, people, generally speaking, struggle with a crisis a crisis of conscience, a crisis of identity, a crisis of personality. We all are going through these three stages at least once a life. You see, in dark ages, the man in black claimed to be conscience for the individuals. Today, the man in white claims to be the conscience for the individuals. There is a fantastic book written in the scripture, the book of Job, the father of patience, that type of patience that is specified in Revelation 14, the patience of the saints. The book of Job is one of the few books in the scripture, in the Old Testament specifically, that describes the complexity of the great conflict. And in this turmoil, Job, a man of God, have received the wrath of the dragon to the full extent, with the limit of sparing his life. He has received the visit of three friends, which in fact have been proven, at the end of the day, enemies of this man in suffering. For 42 chapters, these so-called friends, three friends, in fact, uh, were uh, deceivers, betrayers, and tortioners, the people that tried to destroy the mind and the soul and the fate of Job. In fact, Job declares about the nature of these visitors to be forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Job 13 verse 4. I was not aware of the fact until the pandemic came in the world what type of qualification or professional expertise the three friends of Job uh, did have. But today, I am very shocked and very alarmed to see a history that repeats itself. So the three physicians, the three doctors came there supposedly to comfort Job in his suffering, in his trouble.
Brothers and sisters, I do believe that there are millions of uh, doctors, nurses, medical personnel that have the heart to serve humanity. But amongst these millions of doctors, nurses, medical qualified personnel that work in the hospitals and serve humanity in the pain and suffering, there are few individuals that may conflict their personal interest with the desires of Judas. So, such is the case that Job describes and defines the moral statute of these three physicians that came, uh, quote unquote, to comfort him. It's just amazing. It's an outburst of revelation regarding the type of persecution Job has received in the 42 chapters in his time, and is so meticulously described that makes us understand and relate that the book of Job, his personal experience, the three doctors that were inventors of lies in the biblical text, to be very accurate, says forgers of lies. That's why they were physicians good for nothing, of no value. Why does Job call these three individuals, these three physicians or doctors, um, of no value? Because they were forgers of lies, because they betrayed their oath uh, that says, primo non nocere, first of all, do do not harm. History repeats in our times. If there were physicians in the time of Job that were forgers of lies, inventors of lies, why we should not have the same thing today? Physicians that are forgers of lies. Not everybody. I love and I respect the job. It's amazing job. And most of these uh, physicians that we have today are serving humanity sincerely. But Amongst many, there are few usual betrayers. You can lie with statistics, and that can be forgers of lies, that can be forging, uh, that can be inventing lies. And any man that is forging or invents, creates lies, lose their values. In the book of Job, we have the panorama of the great prophecy of the book of Revelation for the end of time, my friends. Maybe we never connected the book of Job with the book of Revelation, but this is so revealing, so important, because it foresee or features the trouble, the night of Job's trouble of the 144,000 going to the great time of Job or Jacob's trouble, if you wish. What Job experiences in the 42 chapters is what we will face at the end of time. Job faced the wrath of the dragon. The people of God will face the wrath of the dragon in the same manner. As the life of Job was spared, so the life of the people of God will be spared. Job has received the three physicians that were forging lies, so the people of God will receive the visit of the three unclean fallen angels from Revelation 16 that will go to the kings of the earth to instigate them to begin war against the Most High and His servants. Deception and rebellion will be seen at every corner of the street. The matter will come to the point of believing a lie very well masked as truth. In the case of Job, beside the physical suffering, the three doctors inflicted guilt upon his conscience and darkened his hope till they pushed Job's fate to its limits. So, the people of God will suffer physical and mental anguish, brothers and sisters, and will be put on the seat of the accused, of the guilty ones, until their fate will be tried to the utmost intensity, exactly like in the case of Job. And lies will be forged against the people of God to inflict guilt for the death of suffering of others. Job has shown Christian temperance. So we have to preserve that value that is so well stipulated in the principles of our faith. You see, brothers and sisters, this is a different, a next level of what Christian temperance is. A man in suffering that do, does not retaliate. A man in suffering that holds on against the storm of accusations and false lies against him and his belief. The spirit of prophecy says, 
My voice shall be raised against novices undertaking to tread disease professedly according to the principle of health reform. God forbid that we should be subjects for them to experiment upon. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 375. If there ever was a time when the people of God should be on maximum alert, watching for the events that point towards the second coming of Jesus Christ, it is now. If there ever was a time, brothers and sisters, when we should treat our body with more respect and very special care regarding the food, drink, and whatsoever we put into it, that time is now. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or what Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I would like to touch a very sensitive point. One of the most extraordinary elements that are involved in the Christian temperance is a reconfirmation of the principle of faith, point 19, where we reject poisonous medication and we are against all kind of inoculations or vaccinations in within the body against the will and the conscience of the individual. As stated in the Seventh-day Adventist Revolt Movement Principles of Faith in 1925 and reconformed in the Fundamental Principles of Faith 2011, when the, in the full delegation session we voted the value of this book and we do have sufficient ground to hold on on the faith that we have. Principle 19 is the backbone of Christian temperance. If the spirit of prophecy considers the seriousness of drinking coffee as a sin, I think that based on the same criteria to inoculate or introduce on our body through other means unknown liquids can be as serious issue as drinking alcohol, drinking coffee, and other elements that can deprive us and our body of the health that is the gift and the privilege of God. So let us hold fast of what we believe in our principles of faith and review with the spirit of prayer principle 19 in our fundamental Christian beliefs because it's important, it's timely, it's for our time, brothers and sisters. Let us heed the wording. In their practice, the physicians should seek more and more to lessen the use of drugs instead of increasing it. When Dr. A came to the health retreat, she laid aside her knowledge and practice of hygiene and administered the little homeopathic doses for almost every element. This was against the light God had given. Thus, our people who had been thought to avoid drugs in almost every form were receiving a different education. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 282. So what a prophet of the Lord saw at the horizon is a new form of education in the medical world that will hijack the health message that is given to the people of God for these times. Such Education will lead or shift the direction of our church, the direction of Adventism, and will make the apostasy to come rapidly in our midst to the intermedium of a different education. People that at the present time handle the power of science may be tempted, may be tempted to produce the same invention of lies that was created by the three physicians that tried to destroy Job under the pretense common good. Brothers and sisters, I see such coherency between the forgers of lies and what happens today in the scientific world. My appeal to all of you today, brothers and sisters, friends and listeners, is to hold firm on the faith that was once delivered to the saints and do not give up the values of Christian temperance, health reform, diet, physical exercise, positive thinking. All these are a bouquet of flowers that compose Christian temperance for the people of God. Jesus is coming soon. We should be there in the kingdom of God. What he says in the Old Testament, I do the cutting, I do the wound, and I am healing the wound. I am a witness for Christ because natural treatment works and prayer works 
and fasting works and positive thinking works and, and, and a discipline of our mind works. The way that we think works. Brothers and sisters, we are invited to cooperate with the Lord in this final time of crisis. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the message of Christian temperance, which invites us to study the science of eating, drinking, thinking, working, resting, interacting with uh, the people around us. All these elements are combined in this noble, wonderful topic called Christian temperance. It is my wish and my prayer that this year, 2022, will find us in a more profound experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, hiding ourselves in Him, letting our ego and self die on the cross of Calvary, and elevating the beauty of His majesty that is Jesus Christ. If we don't have a chance to see each other on this planet, brothers and sisters, I give you a date, a meeting at the in front of the white throne of our Heavenly Father on the glassy sea when Jesus, you, and the rest of the saved will be together and will hear the beautiful melody of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Come, my beloved, this is the kingdom that I have prepared for you, and now you are officially recognized as citizens of the universe. May the Lord bless us and give us strength and wisdom. My prayer goes to those that are discouraged. My prayer goes to those that have family problems. My prayer goes to those that are at the threshold of divorce. My prayer goes to the young people that are shaking and shifting their faith between belief and presumption. My fate is going for all of us and for the church that we all love. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for being here with me on this evening where we studied one of the most brilliant subjects, which is the opening edge of the entire evangelistic spectrum of our church, Christian temperance. May the Lord bless you richly now and forever. Amen. We would like to thank Pastor Libby Tuberoy for this timely message as he has reminded us of the importance of going back to the basics when it comes to Christian temperance. We will now go to our special music.
Let us now go ahead and close our Bible study with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love and your tender mercies that you've given us. Thank you for this wonderful study that we had and help it to apply to our everyday life as well. And show us every single day how we are to walk with you. In Jesus' name, we would like to thank you for joining us in this study and the study of the Word of God. And we also want to invite you next evening where we will be talking about marriage and the Christian family. It will be presented by Brother Domagit, so don't miss it. I'm sure you will be blessed. And until next time.